we're going to start out by uh, allowing each author space to talk about the focus of their book so that we give them a, give you a chance if you haven't read the books to get an idea of what's in them. And then we will be opening up for a conversation about 25 to 30 minutes uh, amongst the three of us uh, that hopefully I will guide in a manner that uh, works well for all of us. And then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. So uh, let me start out on my left here with Bruce Barcott. Could you tell us a little bit about your book, please? Uh, my book is called Weed the People, The Future of Legal Marijuana in America. And this is a book that uh, really began a few nights before the election of November 2012, um, when we here in Washington were faced with a ballot that had legalization um, before us. And um, as people often do, we gather around with some friends uh, around a table and a bottle of wine. We're talking about the different issues, how we were going to vote. And 502 came up. And the question was, how are you going to do it? How are you going to vote? My, I was very much on the fence. Um, my inclination was to vote against it. Pot wasn't my thing. I hadn't really used it since college. Uh, I had two young teenagers. And um, you know, frankly, I didn't want to, I didn't want to smell the stuff. <laughs> um, but a friend of mine said, look, this is not a vote about whether you like pot or don't like pot. This is a civil rights issue. Um, there are it's a whole generation of people who are locked up for this substance that's really um, less dangerous than alcohol. And um, uh, I went away, thought about it. I, uh, I thought she was probably right. And I held my nose. I voted yes. Um, the next morning, woke up, found that we had legalized marijuana, and wondered what in the world did we just do? Um, so I really spent the next two years trying to answer that question. Uh, um, my background is as a, a science writer, I'm an environmental journalist, and I really sort of dove in with that, with that background. And I thought there could be a really good book in this, essentially because I have no dog in the hunt. Like if marijuana disappeared tomorrow, it wouldn't make a, big, a difference in my life. Um, but I wanted to follow this change in history that we were making, and hopefully I, I thought in, in the end I could let the rest of the country know exactly what we were doing and how it was working out. Um, and I think in the end, that's, that's what I came away with. Uh, I'm, you know, after two years working on this book, uh, I'm not a cannabis connoisseur, but I am very much an advocate for legalization with regulation. I think it's, it's the right way to go. Um, and I think, you know, herkily and jerkily, we're doing it here. Uh, but I think overall, we're, we're getting it right. Um, I, I came about writing this book because I, I am an entrepreneur. I've, um, I've had it in my blood forever. When I graduated from college, I moved to Seattle and I started a chain of ice cream stores here. When I made it to Colorado in 2000, the marijuana industry presented itself to me at a time that I was looking for opportunity. And I, like a lot of people, used marijuana in high school and college um, somewhat regularly, but not uh, by any means all the time. What I realized was that marijuana is a $70 billion a year industry as an illicit drug, and that that money is going to continue to be spent on this regardless of who sells it. And do you want a regulated market to, to sell marijuana where we are growing it with the highest de degree of um, of intention to provide great product, where we're checking IDs, following regulation, and paying taxes? Or do we want to leave it the way it is? The war on drugs has been an abysmal failure, um, and largely because we can't stop demand. You know, people uh, throughout that, the period uh, continued to, to seek it out and want it. And now it, the question is, as a society, what are we going to do with that? So uh, I am an entrepreneur. I'm very much looking at this as a business. I've, I've been doing this for six years, I've had a lot of success with it. It's uh, been the uh, salvation uh, in my life in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful for the position I'm in. Uh, I was the right guy in the right place at the right time. And uh, for that, um, I, I take no credit, um, other than I, I seized an opportunity when it came along. But I think that marijuana is, you know, the, the more I've looked at it, you start to see the, the, uh, the fact that the emperor has no clothes. Um, the, the making marijuana illegal, there's a, a huge social injustice that's been perpetuated over 80 years that we have to deal with. 
Um, the rate of incarceration in the United States is the highest in the free world in the history of the world. We spend more money locking people up for nonviolent drug crimes than it would cost to educate them. Um, it's, you know, there, I, I could go on and on, but I, I come at this again as, a, as an entrepreneur. I've uh, enjoyed a lot of success with this. Um, I understand real clearly from my work in the business where this industry is going. Uh, we're right now building uh, what we call a, a weedery in Colorado, and it's like a winery or a brewery, but for legal marijuana. And our, our intention is to, there's two things. We want to, uh, to be real candid about it, the first is it's economics. We want to grow more product at a better price so that we can sell it and make money. I'm an entrepreneur. The other is we want to, we want to have a place that we can invite people in to, to normalize marijuana, to demystify it, so that you can come in and see how it's grown. Because a lot of people are, you know, you, a lot of people hold this perception of marijuana that's from, from bad information. It's the reefer madness stereotype of, of what marijuana has, has done to society. And my experience with it is, is very opposite. This is a beautiful plant. Uh, it's an extremely fragrant flower that has many varieties, just like roses do. And when you get to know it, you can really appreciate the, the subtle differences in what it has to offer. And I think to, to demystify marijuana and let people understand what it is will begin to break down those, those stereotypes that were built on this misinformation. Also, uh, I think that, uh, that marijuana has a, a very significant role as a medicinal, um, uh, the, the medicinal benefits of marijuana have been overlooked and have a significant role. My father is a, a former physician who uh, is now later in life uh, afflicted with Parkinson's disease. And when I was in high school, he did what most dads do when they catch their son smoking pot with his friends, and he grounded me. Uh, and now later in life, he, you know, again with Parkinson's disease, he's found ways to use medical marijuana that are hugely beneficial. And so, you know, his experience with that led him to further investigate it, and he started to ask, well, why was this? You know, marijuana, um, cannabis, was prescribed as widely as aspirin in the 1850s. But by 1930, it was made illegal. And as a, as a former physician, he looked at it and said, well, why is that? What happened? And why was marijuana taken out of the, the arsenal uh, of drugs that can help alleviate suffering in the United States? So I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of headway to make on, on where we go as a society with marijuana. And um, again, I'm, I'm just I'm real pleased with my uh, opportunity that was presented to me. Uh, again, I feel it's just the right guy in the right place at the right time. And I look forward to moving it forward and trying to do the best we can for society. Thank you. One of the themes in both of your books really is this, you know, this understanding of cannabis reform and cannabis liberalization, cannabis legalization as social policy. In other words, it's happening because it's good for society. Uh, and you come at it from two different perspectives. One is an entrepreneur, another is a journalist. Um, it's very important, I think, that both of you recognize in your book and highlight the, the social injustice associated with it. So I want to start at one level, that the main reason, and this is Pete Holmes's, actually, uh, you know, his, his shtick, that we're legalizing cannabis is, is to start ending the war on drugs. And in that vein, you both have uh, parts of your book that experience, um, uh, that talk about the criminal justice system and experience with policing. And Bruce, you have a very powerful chapter, uh, essentially, that, um, Deals with you going to Louisiana. Yeah. And I'd love for you to talk about that a bit. Yeah, I, I wanted to know, um, I mean, one of the arguments for, uh, really my entry point into this whole debate was that the social, social justice aspect of this, um, where I, I really, I, we're just jailing and imprisoning way too many people, and essentially our marijuana laws are an entry point for that industrial prison system. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, if, Colorado and Washington are the leading edge of marijuana reform. Where's the trailing edge? You know, where is the absolute end of the parade back there? And I, I assumed, well, it's got to be Mississippi, right, or Texas. And it turned out to be Louisiana. And it really surprised me because, you know, we associate Louisiana with Mardi Gras, New Orleans, good times, strolling down Bourbon Street with a hurricane, right? Um, 
No, Louisiana has this strange history with marijuana going back to the 1920s. <laughs> um, and the marijuana laws there are just, just uh, they're completely nuts. Um, I, I started looking into it and heard about a number of cases down there and sort of followed up. Um, and there's a whole chapter in the book, basically, that's, that, that follows the case of a gentleman named Bernard Noble, who's exactly my age. Um, he was stopped in New Orleans for literally bicycling while black back in 2010. Um, you can read the, the police report. That's all, pretty much what it says. Um, and had a couple of joints on him, was arrested, thrown in jail. He had a couple of prior uh, drug convictions, no violent crimes or anything like that. And because he had those two priors, he was what they call triple billed, which is their version of the three strikes law. Um, and under the triple bill, what two joints gets you in the state of Louisiana is 13 years and three months in jail, in prison. Um, and that's what he got. Uh, he appealed it, uh, a number of judges throughout the appeal essentially looked at his case you know, the guy's supporting kids, he's a, he's a truck driver, he's got a good job. And the judges said, look, this is ridiculous, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut this down to five years, which is still outrageous, but you know, five years, okay. Um, now the New Orleans DA, for them, that was not good enough. They wanted the whole 13, and they went all the way to the Louisiana Supreme Court. And what the Louisiana State Supreme Court said was that they looked at this case and they said, you know, with these mandatory minimums, we can only derivate from the sentence in extraordinary circumstances. And Bernard Noble's case is not in any way extraordinary in the state of Louisiana. So he's, he is serving the full 13 years. He's in a prison called Corcoran State Prison right now uh, in Louisiana. So that was really, um, uh, and occasionally I still get phone calls from him. He's, he's, he's still there and wondering what the hell he's doing in prison. Um, so that was uh, sort of my deep dive into, um, into the, uh, the over-incarceration in America and the ways in which marijuana acts as, a, as an entry point um, for that. It was, a, it was a sort of tough, sobering chapter for me. So Christian, I wanted to balance that with uh, asking you to recount the evolving attitudes of uh, police as you encountered them as a medical marijuana entrepreneur mm -hmm. in Colorado. Sure. Uh, in my book, uh, one, of, one of the points I illustrate is that when I first got into this in, in 2009, they, it was very unknown. And one of the great unknowns was that law enforcement, and I really mean the, the the, the people on the street, the cops on the street that are charged with really doing something with what's on the books, didn't have a lot of background information and they were very frustrated by it. Um, and early on, I, um, I was actually, uh, I had uh, quite legally um, sold a, a bunch of clones. And so when we have clones, we have a lot of small plants that we're about to turn into much bigger plants. And when we had, I had some excess and so I, I uh, contacted someone who wanted to buy them. I met this person in the parking lot of a, a Safeway and I uh, sold him the plants. He, uh, we put the plants in his trunk. He gave me the money. And right after that happened, a, a cop shows up. Uh, and this cop showed up and it turned into a very frustrating situation, particularly for the cop, because this woman didn't have any sense of what she was supposed to do with this. You know, here, you know, Two years ago, this was completely illegal. Like, if you catch somebody with marijuana, it's, it's simple. You throw handcuffs on them, you put them in the back of your cruiser, you take them down to jail, you arrest them, you get a felony, and there's probably some, like, police pride in being able to book a felony. And the, this, this officer now was really frustrated because when they, she pulled up, he, she said, well, what are you doing? And again, I have a, a policy of being open and notorious about everything that I do. And so she said, well, what happened? I said, well, he and I both have our medical marijuana cards, and I just had some excess plants, which I sold him. The plants are in his trunk, and his money's in my pocket. <laughs> and she looked at me, and, and, and we pulled out our IDs, and there was an ID and, a, and our red card, your medical marijuana card. And we both handed this person, this cop, our, our, our IDs and our medical marijuana cards. And she was, like, noticeably pissed. <laughs> Very uncomfortable. But it was because the world around her was shifting. You know, when you were, if you got into policing, you wanted to go and catch the bad guys. And the bad guys are the people who break the laws. And the laws are those things that are written on the books, and it's really clear, it's black or white. And for her, she was in this very confused state, and she uh, ends up going back to her car and spending like 15 minutes in her car, at which point I was absolutely convinced I was about to be 
you know, thrown into Cochrane State Prison for 13 years and three months. And um, so I'm taking off my, my watch and putting my wallet in the car and getting ready to be arrested. And she finally comes back up and gives us a very short but stern lecture on, that really reflected her frustration of being in this world that it was evolving with change. Um, and then I juxtapose that with uh, several years later, uh, which is about 18 months ago now, uh, we were burglarized uh, for the fifth time. And at this particular burglary, I, I got a call in the middle of the night from our security company and says, Mr. Haggis, Seth, uh, you know, digital safe security, your, your alarm's gone off. And they start to recite the different alarm zones that's happened. I pull up my iPad, and at this point we have, we have a lot of surveillance cameras that's all state regulated. Um, the benefit of having those is that I was able to see the criminals get away. I'm pretty sure the guy was wearing Nikes. That was I saw his shoe dart out of the picture. And so uh, right after that then, I see the police pull up, and they, they, the police were unable to catch them, but I, you know, they, they call me back and they're like, well, you need to come down. And so here I am in the middle of the night, driving down to one of my grows in Denver, and I know that I'm about to encounter you know, a bunch of Denver's finest, the Denver Police Department, uh, are going are gonna to be there because they called me. And I pulled up and at, at the, I had this moment where I caught myself and I said, well, like, how solid are these laws? You know, are they, are they, do, the, do the police really believe in these laws? Because I do, and I'm operating a business on it, and the, the warehouse that they're standing in front is absolutely filled with marijuana. And I pull up and there's five cops there and two of them actually have their guns out, like pointed at our front door. And I'm thinking, boy, the bad guys must still be inside. And they come up and say, listen, if you're the owner, um, just go ahead and stand back. We don't know who's inside still. We're bringing the, we're bringing the police dogs in. And I think, well, now I'm, my, fi my ship is officially sunk. <laughs> like, if, if they don't know this, is, this place is filled with weed now, the police dogs are definitely going to tell them. Right? <laughs> so I pull, kind of pull one of the cops aside, and I'm like, listen, do you know, like, this is a, like a legal medical marijuana grow. Like, are you aware of that? The guy's like, oh, yeah, like, we knew that on our way here, and plus they spilled a whole bunch of your skunk berry over there. <laughs> I'm like, well, how do you know it's skunk berry is one of the strains that we grow? And I'm like, how do you know it's skunk berry? And he's like, well, there's a part of a label left on it, and plus we were looking at it and smelling it, and it looks really great. <laughs> you know? And so these, <laughs> the cops then end up, the second time now, they, they end up holding me out because they want to bring the police dogs in and sweep them through all of our locked rooms, which are all, again, filled with growing marijuana plants and make sure that none of the bad guys are there before they, they let me in there. And so in the, in the first example, I, in early in my career doing this, I was, I was confronted with a very frustrated police officer who was really uncertain about how to do her job because the world had changed around her. Her job was to enforce the laws, but the laws were changing, and they're in this point of flux that she wasn't able to really understand what her role was. And in the second occasion, it was long enough that the Denver police had gotten very clear on what marijuana was, who we were as legitimate operators, how to tell us apart from the, the illegitimate operators. And when I got there, I was really greeted as a, um, as, a, as a business owner, as one of the good guys, and they were there to assist me and make sure that the, the, the bad guys were in fact gone and then to help me to secure my, uh, my premise and property. Um, so it was a, a big shift of perception, I believe, on, on the part of law enforcement over that short period of time. Um, but then I think probably a reflection worth early in this too is that very early on when I was hiring our first grower, I encountered a young man who was 27 years old and he was probably pretty qualified to do this, but he had just finished eight years in prison. And the reason was is that when he was about to enter his freshman year of college, he was growing marijuana in his garage and the feds came in and busted him. And he did eight years of hard time in federal prison. And I looked at this guy, and you know, at the time I'm in my mid-30s, and I'm thinking to myself, like, this guy, he could be me. He's a, he, 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 was, uh, he was a nice guy, he, he presented himself well, he was articulate, he had spent eight years in federal prison, he had no tattoos, he had told me he wasn't part of any gang, and that really that his, his whole life was derailed from the fact that he was growing this plant. And he did it knowing that it was illegal, but he spent eight years in prison, and during that eight years, life had changed around him again. And, the, and now when he got out of prison, he went to prison for growing marijuana. When he got out of prison, he came to apply for a job with me to grow marijuana, but legally. 
And so I, um, again, very much appreciate the fact that I do everything, what I do every day is I do it with a license that um, has, has really changed the, that, that legal makeup. Yeah, we sort of operate in this strange flux period right now where it's, there are time warps sort of all around us, little pockets, right? Because mm -hmm. when I was finishing up this book, um, I got a call from the legal department, and um, this is published by, by Time Inc., and their legal folks back in New York were really nervous, and they said, well, did you get, did you get releases from everybody, you know, in your book who's quoted and, you know, as being in the marijuana industry? And I'm like, no, no. like that's, <laughs> that's not how journalism works. Um, but really everybody who's in the book is, or, you know, is open about what they do. And, and you really ought to actually come out from New York and see, you know, spend time in Denver or Seattle and, and see how it's going out here. And they, they, it took them a while to adjust to that, um, that idea that, that these people are op operating, you know, not just state legally, but as you say, openly, and that's part of the, the strategy is to, to, to operate openly um, and above board. But there are these weird little pockets that still exist. Um, you know, they exist in Louisiana. Sadly, you may have heard about the case in Kansas. They exist in Kansas in, in a real way. You know, there's this 11-year-old kid in Kansas a couple weeks ago who basically spoke up during a, a, you know, a drug lesson in class and said, well, you know, my mom uses medical marijuana and it's actually a medicine for her. Um, well, basically the cops went to his house that day and arrested the mother, and, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's a huge, horrible fiasco. Um, but those, those, you hit those little pockets here and there. Um, I was in uh, Washington, D.C. about two weeks ago, um, and I had some time to kill, and so I looked up, I said, well, I wonder where the DEA is, where are they located? And they're outside D.C. at the uh, Pentagon City Station. Yeah, and I went to, they actually have a little museum there, a DEA museum, and it's fascinating. If you have a chance, you should really go. It's just this tiny, it's probably no bigger than this room. I mean, it's, it's really small, but it's amazing um, because you walk in there and there's the, the, the exhibits are, are really interesting. Um, there's a lot of like old smuggling stuff, you know, people hollowed out shoes and, and this sort of thing. But what's incredible is to walk in and the introduction to the museum, um, they have an, a steel crack house door, you know, from the 80s where there's a slot in there and everything. And next to that is a medical marijuana dispensary door. And I was just, I was just like, really? Really? Like it's 2015 and this is, this is the exhibit you have up. I mean, I, I wrote a little piece on it and, you know, medical marijuana now is polling nationally at 86% acceptance. Like, and I said, you know, that's, that's, that's higher than apple pie in the flag. And I actually, because they want links to it, I actually found polls. Apple pie is like 13% of pie lovers love apple pie, the flag, you know, who knows. But, but there is, you know, we operate, we live in this, these bubbles of Seattle, these bubbles of Denver. But yeah the old world is still very much alive out there. You know, the world, old world is, but it, it also changed. I mean, uh, Georgia passed a medical marijuana bill in the, in the last week. Um, Utah, uh, you know, is working on a medical marijuana bill as well. So there, there is a shift in ideology that's going where I think that, you know, again, the, the war on drugs has been an abysmal failure. And as you start to see, you know, I, I think this room, uh, you know, if we were to pull this room, you would say, well, how many people in here have had experience with marijuana? And how many feel that it, it, it meets all the, you know, all the messages we've been given by the, the federal government uh, over the years, or how many believe that it's different? And I think it's that, that reality that we're like, you know what, the, my experience with this drug does not match what I've been told. And so y we need a new way of thinking about it. And so that shift in perception is coming. It just comes slowly, you know, and again, our, our elected officials, like in Kansas, you know, you get a sheriff who's got a, who wants, for, wants to be reelected and is looking at, I need to be hard on crime, and this is a, you know, this is probably a Christian county, or, I mean, gosh, you know, who, who knows what axe he's grinding. Um, uh, Chris Christie right now in New Jersey is a perfect example of that, you know, and it's like, there, yeah, there's political yeah. gains to be made yeah. by being and, hard and on that's, crime. That's one of the questions, I'm sure you get this as well, one of the questions is, well, why is, why are these states legalizing and the federal government's doing nothing, and it's still, um, you know, nobody was ever lost an election for being too tough on crime mm -hmm. or, or most, you know, it's, it's, um, there's still for a lot of politicians, at least back in Congress, it's, it's, a, it's a third rail issue. You know, they're yeah. really afraid to touch it. Well, I mean, uh, it's interesting that you should speak in terms of pockets of, uh, you know, because I think of actually just completely separate ontological realities occupying the same space and even in Washington state. 
where we just recriminalized medical marijuana in the last week. You know, like Utah is going forward with medical marijuana. Georgia and in Washington State, we just created two new felonies for medical marijuana patients in the last week, our legislature. So there's, this, there's, if you look at what the legislature, how they talk about it, how they think about it, it doesn't sound that different from what you would expect to find in Kansas or Louisiana. Mm -hmm. They're still terrified of it. How, how are we operating in these totally separate realities but in the same space? And, and your books, I think, both really speak to, uh, you know, the unwillingness to face being wrong that we have mm -hmm. a, a difficulty with in the United States. What does it mean to actually admit that reality is not what we've thrown people in jail for for 40 years? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Uh, it's, it's really hard to admit you're wrong. I mean, it's, we have a new, you know, we have the current DEA leader stepping down this week, yeah. right? Um, sometimes what it takes, <laughs> look, sometimes what it takes, I mean, this is, this is a, in a completely different sphere, but, um, you know, I've been working on a book on uh, the Bolt decision for years and years now. It's still coming. It's a long book. But, um, you know, for an entire generation of state leaders here fought that decision. For a decade, they fought it. And the state only really came around to embracing that decision and working with the tribes after that generation of people retired and went away. It, they, they were never going to turn on that issue. It was just, it was just too, too much a part of them. And, you know, maybe a new DEA leader can turn, you know, turn toward progress a little more than, than the current one, you know, just because they're new and they're coming in. Um, I mean, we've got now three senators who have actually taken a step and said, look, we're going to try to at least, you know, as a symbol, uh, federally legalize medical marijuana in states where it's, you know, where it's been accepted. Um, and that's, that's, I think that's a huge step. Uh, you know, who else besides, you know, a couple of Congress people have, have done that? Uh, it's, it's, and one of them is running for president, Rand Paul. So that's, you know, a, a small step, but there's still a lot of things that have to occur. One of them, I think the idea of your weedery is absolutely the way to go because I can't tell you how many, how many um, you know, uh, grow houses or processing facilities I went to in, in Colorado and Washington and came out saying, you guys, what you have to do is just start tours mm -hmm. of these places. Start tours so that both people, but especially policy leaders can come in here and just see it. Mm -hmm. They may still be against it when they leave, that's fine. But just l allow them to come in and see this plant growing, mm -hmm. see what you're doing with it, and take away the mystery. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, um, let me set you up real quick. Uh, in many ways, maybe that's what you know, business does. You know, uh, it's, I think there's an element of truth to you know, the assertion that you know, Americans like entrepreneurialism. And if cannabis comes to entrepreneurialism, basically, they're going to be more open to cannabis because it's coming to them in a package that, like, is, is familiar to them. And so you know, I think that your book is very interesting in the way it talks about how business changes that conversation mm -hmm. and, and in many ways the way Bruce just described it. Yeah. You know, I'm, um, I'm pretty cynical when it comes to business. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, and really it's in my blood, but it, for me it's about creation, creating. I, I love the creative aspects of entrepreneurship. I don't, I don't paint, I don't uh, dance, I don't write music. Right? The creation that I do is I've, I have an idea and I like to get people around it and, and motivate it and organize and create a product out of it and make it work. That's my creative passion. But when I look at business, I get very cynical. And I start to, when you say, well, what are those pockets out there? I mean, you, you look at, well, why was marijuana ever criminalized? If it was prescribed as much as aspirin in 1850, why was it criminalized? And you can, in my book, I look at some of the threats that it was. It was you know, it was a, a threat to Weyerhaeuser, because if you have a, you know, a, a quick growing and readily available alternative to wood pulp, you're not going to sell as many, you're not going to be able to cut down and sell as many trees. Um, it was a threat to DuPont, because they were coming out with nylon at the time. And again, if you have a, a, a natural fiber that is going to do that, you, have, you only have so much big of a pie, and it's going to be less. And so you would start to look at these other business interests that are out there, and you'd say, well, why don't these people want this, this otherwise naturally occurring plant that we've lived besides for 
tens of thousands of years, so much so that we have uniquely have you know, chemical receptors in our brains to, to use the, the active chemicals in it. Well, why is that? And again, I get very cynical about that. One of the things we were talking about backstage before this was the, that in, in Washington, my understanding, and please correct me where I'm wrong here, was that there's the, the difference between medical and recreational stores. And in Colorado, if you were selling medical marijuana, you were, we were the first ones welcome to sell recreational marijuana because we were doing it, we were established, we understood the business, we were operating. Uh, in Washington, they said they went the other way, and they said, no, if you're in medical, you can't be in recreational. And it's because the folks in recreational that, that were advocating for that felt that these people would be a, a, a threat to them. And again, I come at, I, I, I gave you the, the early description of, as an entrepreneur, this is more of my creative passion in life than to be a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a greedy, I'm not a, a greedy businessman so much as I love to create, and I create through business. And the, I think that one of the, the, the cynicism I have around business and those pockets is that a lot of people get into business to enrich themselves. And you can enrich yourself by making your product acceptable and the other person's illegal. And there's been a lot of history of that, especially around marijuana, as a medicine, as a fiber, as a fuel, as a food. And you all can see it right now in Washington because of what's happened between the medical dispensaries and the recreational dispensaries. There are forces in business that will actively lobby at the highest levels and push money into elected people's pockets to benefit themselves. And there is a root of evil in that activity that has to be addressed. And I believe that uh, that creates some of those pockets. I mean, the, and you know, the flip side of that, or maybe working more hand in hand with that, is um, essentially the urge of politicians or people in power to build on that power. And that's, you know, in the 1930s, this, you had Harry Anslinger, who was the J. Edgar Hoover of, mm -hmm. of drugs, um, essentially saw in marijuana this way to build his portfolio. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was, this was the demon drug that America needed protection from, and he was the man to protect us. Sure. Um, and continued to build on that and build on that. I mean, in, in, in very systematic ways, he had an entire notebook essentially filled with um, clippings of headlines from the Hearst newspapers that said, you know, demon weed about to capture children of California, you know, mm. um, all this sort of thing. And that just sort of built on itself. But there was also an essentially, um, you know, an, an ignorance of what marijuana was back then in terms of the people who were voting on those measures. You know, when, it, when the vote came up in 1937 to, to make marijuana illegal, the, the people in Congress were like, uh, yeah, what's this bill? Uh, marijuana Tax Act, 1930. Yeah, what's it about again? You know, what's marijuana again? You know, it's, ba oh, it's bad. It's bad news. You know, if they were if they were doing the same thing to bourbon, you know, all hell would have broken loose. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't the, that wasn't their drug. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, marijuana was not the drug of the people and the white people really in power. Um, so that really plays along into it as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um it's interesting history not just sort of repeat itself but to be co-present you know to to be uh you know something we thought we were over but it's you know it just keeps coming back in very unexpected ways um i'd like to ask both of you um a broad question uh which is um actually i have two broad questions actually let me start with a more specific broad question one is that, uh, you know, in terms of people who don't understand cannabis, have no relationship with it, don't have information about it, one of their challenges is, is what about the kids? What do we tell our children? How do we relate to our children? And both these authors actually address this themselves in, in their books. I'd like, like to have them both uh, take a stab at the what about the kids question. Sure. You know, um, I care a lot. I've got three daughters. They're 12, 10, and 10. Um, and I love them with all of my heart and I, I want the world that they inherit from me to be better than the one that I inherited from my parents and I hope that they have that same motivation. The, what I tell my kids is I'm, I'm very honest about what I do um, and I keep it age appropriate. You know, my kids don't under, need to understand social injustice at 10 years old. I'll, I'll wait till they're 11. Uh, <laughs> get them started. 
But the, um, you know, I, I am very open with them about what I do, um, open about why I do it. Uh, when they ask questions, I, tell, I, I do tell them. And I, you know, really I think what it comes from is a, a, a fervent belief that I hold that um, what I'm doing is both okay, uh, it's legal, it's not illegal, that I, I treat my business uh, very responsibly, I treat my employees well, um, I try to write, keep to the highest standards. And so for me, it's just, there's no hiding it. There's no shame. I'm not, I'm not ashamed that I'm in the marijuana business. I'm pretty proud. Uh, you know, he mentioned the, that I, I won the 2014 Cannabis Cup. Well, we actually defended that title on Sunday night. And so I legitimately grow some of the best weed in the world. And I'm absolutely sure any one of my daughters could repeat that line for you. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm proud of what I do, and I'm, I'm proud of it for a lot of reasons, and the ones that the kids know right now are what's age appropriate. All that said, I tell you what, man, I'm a dad. I don't want my kids smoking pot. They're children. You know, I want them to be children. I want them to laugh and play and pray and learn about life in a, in a complete way before they start using intoxicants to change the way they feel. I want them to know that they are good enough just as they are. And they don't need a sip of alcohol, a, a drag on a joint, a pill, or a boyfriend, or anything else <laughs> to tell them that they're okay. They're okay just the way they are. And so how do I feel about kids? I think that it's really important that kids understand what's going on in the world. And I'll tell you what, one of the most, the deadliest drugs out there right now are prescription opiates. And it's the prescription opiates that are sitting in almost every one of our medicine cabinets right now, and that children will go in and unintentionally grab. My, uh, my mom's long-term boyfriend, a uh, wonderful man named Bob, he, uh, his grandson died because he had a headache. And he went into his mom's medicine cabinet, and he took three pills. They all happened to be oxycodone. And he didn't wake up in the morning. So, marijuana has a place. And the one that I am absolutely certain of is that it's safer than a lot of these other things. It's a safer intoxicant than alcohol. It's, a, it's much better for us than cigarettes. It's, it doesn't pose nearly the risks of opiates. Now, you hold it aside, and you, if, you, if you think that there's a, a cause, you know, a correlation and a causality between using marijuana and then moving on to cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine and all these other illicit drugs, I would say that the, the largest correlation is simply because if it's illegal to buy, then you're going to go buy some marijuana and it's, it's illegal and you're going down to your dealer, that dealer is the most likely person to also have cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine because they're also illegal. But if, if marijuana is in the hands of people like me, I check IDs. I pay my taxes. I care about our society. You know, there's no way that we're also selling cocaine in our, in our stores or, or methamphetamine. And so my thing with the kids is I care, and I, I know there's a lot of people out there that love their kids, and I promise you this, I care about mine as much as you care about yours. I love them with all my heart, and I want them to have um, every opportunity in this world. And so I, I tell them the truth, I'm proud of what I do, and I absolutely believe that marijuana has a place in our society um, that will um, n create no further harm. And I'm able to communicate that to them. Well, the question of kids is one that runs through my book, um, sort of from start to finish, and it, uh, it came up early on where, where you know I'm having conversations with my wife about writing this book about, uh, about pot and legalization. And, uh, you know, early on I wanted to know, essentially, what was going on, how to talk to my kids about marijuana um, in a way that started from a place of, of facts. I mean, I'm, I'm a science writer, this is what I'm, I'm trying to go into these studies and understand what it's doing to the body, to the mind. Um, and I wanted to talk to my kids in a very uh, rational, real way about what we were doing in Washington State and why I didn't want them uh, smoking marijuana. And, you know, I thought that I would have this, you know, two-year period of amassing facts, and at the end I'd have this amazing, you know, PowerPoint lecture slide, and they'd all sit there and watch, and I was like, notice, point A, B. Um, <laughs> But really what happened was essentially the, the conversation started early uh, when, I, when I was first pitching the book and, and sold it and started writing it. 
Um, and uh, because our daughter and son, our son's now 13, or my daughter's um, 16, they would essentially say, so how's that pot book going, Dad? Because they thought it was hilarious that their square father was writing this book about, about weed. Um, so those were, each of those were opportunities to basically to start this conversation. I said, oh, it's pretty interesting. You know, I'm talking to this guy today who, you know, is growing over in Colorado, or I'm talking to this guy who's, who's uh, studying, you know, the effects on the brain at Columbia back in New York, and here's what they're finding. Um, and so it became a, a sort of rolling series of small conversations, maybe over dinner, or maybe on the way to school, maybe on the way home. Um, and it turned into, it, it sort of broadened the scope of um, conversation where it starts with pot, but it opens up into alcohol, and it opens up into sex, and, and, and difficult conversations that nobody likes to have with their kids, or at least nobody likes to start them. But this was a way in where, because I was writing the book, and you can use a little humor, um, we really had some great conversations about this. Um, and we had some conversations about um, age appropriateness, you know, we set all these various barriers from, you know, driver's license at 16 to, you know, smoking and alcohol at these ages. And we talked a little bit about how those come about through both experience and research and how we're trying to do that now with marijuana. You know, Willie at one point, um, he saw a segment on the Colbert Report about um, uh, Rob Ford, the mayor of Toronto, you know, who's hoovering half the city up his nose, and he said, well, I have an idea what, you know, I know what marijuana is, but what is crack? What is, what is, what is that, you know? And I said, okay. So we put it on pause and I say, look, we've got this huge spectrum of, of drugs that affect your body and mind. You know, over here we've got um, Coca-Cola and caffeine, coffee, aspirin, Advil, um, you know, working our way up toward, toward prescription drugs. And, and um, for the longest time, we basically put marijuana way over here um, with, you know, heroin and, and cocaine and meth. And I said, well, and by the way, here's what crack is, you know. Um, but now, really through research and experience, we're moving marijuana over into this other category, more sort of in the alcohol area. And we're trying that, and we're going to see if it works. We don't know if it's going to work yet, but we think it will. Um, and that's what we're working on right now. Um, and we just continue that conversation. That's, that's, that's how it goes, you know. I mean, they... Um, you know, they know there's beer in the fridge and there's liquor in the cabinet. Um, they, you know, they, they, I have a vape pen. They don't know where that is, but you know, it's, it's, it's part of that conversation. If, um, uh, I guess I'll leave, I'll leave it there, but it's, it's worked out much better than I expected. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask both of you actually along those lines, um, uh, because this is often, you know, um, I think comes up as, as an issue in both of your books and certainly un understandably so. The question of edibles and uh, the practice in in Colorado uh, as well as here of you know having a cookie that's seven servings, right? Like a, mm -hmm. this is like a hundred milligram cookie. Who in their right mind breaks that cookie up into like seven pieces and takes it? Uh, and so like that sort of you know uh, how 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 has Colorado dealt with? Uh, the, the edibles question, even though it was a little bit ridiculous with the Maureen Dowd stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I want to ask him, where have you guys gotten, I guess, uh, yeah. with that? Uh, has anybody ever had a bad edibles experience? Anyone? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I love cookies. Like, you're not going to tell me, especially when I'm high, right? You're not going to tell me to have one eighth of a cookie. So, um, Colorado, we've had a lot of bad experiences with this, to tell you the truth, and it's, uh, it's been challenging. Um, but I'll tell you what, if we go to a bar tonight, right, and we have one ounce of spirits, five ounces of wine, or 12 ounces of beer, we all have an expectation that that's one drink. And we understand, like, I can have one drink and still drive, and I'm going to come in under that 0 .08 limit. So I understand that there's an industry out there selling me intoxicants, but I have a way of knowing what I'm getting out of it. So when you say, what has Colorado done with this? We've, um, we kind of got out to this crazy start. And there's these things called decas, and they were uh, chibachus, which is basically a Tootsie Roll that had uh, 10 servings of, um, of THC in it. So if you ate one of these things, um, and assuming you weren't a rhinoceros or an elephant, you were going to be on your ass. I mean, these things were potent. 
And you start looking and say, well, who, who needs 10 servings of these in, in one of those? And so there was a lot of negative experiences uh, that came around just that, that I, I over-ingested. Um, and that, again, it has a, part of it has to do with the way edibles, you know, it, it takes a lot longer to, for the onset. You know, you, you smoke a joint, you hit a vape pen, and you pretty much know in three to five seconds if you've had enough. And if you've had enough, you just stop. It's one of the beauties of marijuana. Um, but with edibles, it's, you know, 45 minutes on an empty stomach, an hour and a half if you just ate something else. And so you, you, know, you eat it and you're like, well, this isn't kicking in. And so you finish the rest of that eight serving cookie. And then all eight servings kick in. And then you're just like, I mean, you're wondering what happened. And so um, Colorado, only now in recreational actually, went to a, they mandated a 10 milligram serving limit. And again, I think that gets back to that you know, an ounce of spirits, five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer. If you know that one serving, which is in one complete piece of product, mm -hmm. is, is one, then, and you understand what, how that affects you, then you as an individual can develop reasonable expectations about what this intoxicating thing that's being sold to you will do. And that's a responsibility that uh, I believe that, you know, that, that I, I hold, that we hold as uh, members of this industry where we're producing these products is, to produce products that are understood and safe for consumers, and also to um, you know to make to be reasonable about what it is to to use our products. Uh, I certainly don't want anyone, you know, using too much of whatever we're doing and, and driving a car and, and doing something stupid. You know, we want to we want to yeah. create a good situation. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. You know, I think um, the week that Maureen Dowd's column came out, if uh, I think most of you are familiar with it, but basically Maureen Dowd wrote a column, um, probably. April mm -hmm. last year, something yeah. like that, where basically she, she said, look, entire column was all about her bad trip because she ate the whole candy bar mm -hmm. um, in her hotel room in Denver. And she was the butt of everybody's joke for a whole week. Mm -hmm. But I t I'm telling you, Maureen Dowd gave the entire industry in both states an incredible gift. And that was just to, to put it out there and say, mm -hmm. look, this is, this is real. This is happening. What are you going to do about it? And honestly, I, I, I am you know, glad. I think Colorado really stepped up and did something about it. You know, the governor appointed this task force. They went immediately on in, into these rules about packaging and dosage, mm -hmm. dosage and this sort of thing. Um, because it is a problem, and it's a problem for a couple of reasons. I, I mean, not a problem, but I think it's a challenge, mm -hmm. right, to, to get this right. A, because the federal government has made it so difficult to do research on pot in, in a variety of ways, uh, nobody had really a lot of data to go on in terms mm -hmm. of how this stuff affects, affects people. Um, and then I think you have a lot of newcomers or people who are coming back to marijuana after you know, leaving it in college. And for them, smoking is not a pleasant experience. So mm -hmm. they're just like, oh, well, yeah, cookie, sure. Let me take that. But like you say, you know, imagine going into a, a bar and ordering daiquiris, and they are delicious but they're not going to kick in for 45 minutes, right? right? right. So, so give me another strawberry daiquiri. This thing's yeah. great, right? And then, oh, my God, an hour and a half later, you are really, um, the floor is rolling. Yeah. Um, so I, it, the third part of that, I think, that, that's challenging is smoking is a more, um, it's, it's more of an act that you have to actually go out and, and do. You know, it's, you have to find a space, you have to light up, find a lighter, this sort of thing. And like you say, you inhale, and it, it hits you pretty quickly. Whereas edible, like, it's... Anywhere and anywhere. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's um, I'm still like, edibles are here. They're not going to go away. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we still have to continue to find ways to treat them with respect and really both educate people about what they're taking and how to take them. And on the industry side, continue to refine the message, the packaging, mm -hmm. um, and just how, how they're sold. Yeah. You know, it makes a big difference to take a second when you're in a store with a customer and saying, I mean, I'm sure your people do this. Say, look, let's talk about this. This is what's going to happen. Here's how you should do this. Because a lot of people who are in there for the first time especially are just like what's stunned by the variety yeah. or they're nervous as hell and they want to get out, yeah. right? So yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting you know, I situation. Think, you, know, you mentioned the, uh, the thing about lack of research and one of the things that we've realized recently is, again, for anyone out here who's ever smoked marijuana before, uh, there's some types that you smoke and it really gives you what you call couch lock. You know, you just pretty much want to hang out. You can watch all three Godfather movies back to back. You want, you want to have a full pizza and then maybe get bring me some of those Oreos and you're just, you're like sitting in your seat and don't really care to go anywhere. 
there's other types of marijuana that you smoke it and you start to feel uh, giddy, almost happy, uh, euphoric, you want to dance, you want to talk to your friends. Well, why? Because the underlying molecules of marijuana are THC, CBD, CBN, a handful of those. Those molecules are consistent. So why would one form of marijuana affect you differently than the other? And the little we know about it now, from based on really what is a complete lack of research, is that there's these things called terpenes and flavonoids that go along with marijuana. And so those create a different affect on the user based on the terpene and flavonoid profile of certain marijuana. And so we don't even know enough right now because of the blackout on research to say, how is this going to affect you? You know, if you are, you know, if you've got a, if you're an O positive blood type and you use the uh, limoni, uh, you know, terpene along with THC, how is that going to affect you? Because if that's you, it's very relevant. Uh, but again, mar marijuana has been blacked out for a long yeah, time. Yeah, and it's, you know, right now, basically, I'm sure you have this, this, this reaction, but right now I feel like I'm this weird little, um, hub of information mm -hmm. in our community like people stop me in the grocery store in the produce section and say you know everything from you know my my father's got you know arthritis or something and he, he's looking for a topical what can you tell me yeah to you know asking me about the difference between um like a vape pen and smoking the full leaf which is a really interesting difference i mm -hmm. feel like the, the vape pen is much more of a like a sip of wine right yeah. it's very thin and depends then, on and, the battery you're using well yeah okay yeah <laughs> but they're very different and <laughs> It, right now, that's still just neighbor to neighbor, friend it to is. friend knowledge. Yeah. You know? And, and mm -hmm. the research angle is opening up a tiny bit, but it really is it's still incredibly difficult to, yeah. to get anything greenlit. My uh, uh, good friends and my neighbors, um, he is the director of neurosurgery at the University of Colorado, the Anschutz Medical Center, where they do a, it's the medical research hospital in Colorado, and she is also a physician. And they got a, a call from a, a a family in Canada where their 21-year-old son was having intractable seizures, was in a medically induced coma. And they said, hey, this is after Sanjay Gupta's first thing came out about Charlotte's Web. And they said, we want to move our son down to Colorado so that you all can give him this, you know, this CBD oil and see if this works. And she went out, uh, the, the wife in this situation went out and said, well, yeah, let's see if we can do that. And she's a very proactive, hard-charging type woman. And uh, when she found out that the University of Colorado Research Hospital would not allow this, she said, well, wait a second, if, this is a, if it's truly medical marijuana and we're in Colorado and we are the Colorado Research Hospital, why can't we, as physicians, understand this and, and try to help this, this patient? And she just became very frustrated. And I think that you know, when I, I, I use that point to illustrate that we are at this time of flux with the legalization of marijuana, where we acknowledge that there are medical benefits that have been denied, that there's been such a huge lapse of time that you know, we haven't done any significant research on marijuana or its components for you know, 80 years. And now we're at this point where we're looking at all this hope, but trying to figure out how we're gonna realize that potential. You know, does, there's this thing called Phoenix Tears that a lot of people claim will like, not, not just like fight cancer, cure cancer. That's a bold statement to make especially if you have cancer. Like, are you gonna pursue this? Are you gonna go find this product if you believe it's gonna help you? Absolutely. How about if it's your loved one? How about if it's your kid, right? And they're, they're, their chemo is not responding. They're, they're not progressing. Are you gonna go find this? And so the, the people that are the most desperate, that are in need of marijuana's healing properties, are gonna be the leading edge of this learning process. And we're in this point of frustration frankly, where, I mean, I'm grateful that we, that we got here, that we've come out of the dark and we're moving into the light, but we haven't made that transition yet. And so we've got, we've got work to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, um, one of my favorite scenes in the book was where I actually ha happened to um, attend a, essentially an ethics brown bag, um, hour-long seminar at, at CU, the Denver, the medical campus there. And there were, you know, physicians, administrators, nurses from Children's Hospital there, and the, the conversation was all about their frustration in terms of they both get patients, but they also get phone calls from physicians and patients and parents around the country, people desperate to know, what, how do I get this stuff, how do I use it, 
and they want to help, but they are so constrained by federal rules and um, the, the, the gray murkiness that exists around all this, they don't know exactly what they can say legally, mm -hmm. um, and, and they're, they're desperate. They are desperate for data mm -hmm. on this. But. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a very interesting quote that I've been I, I'm copying and pasting it around the internet from your book, Bruce, uh, uh, that speaks to this really interesting situation where we've got actually cannabis entrepreneurs who are providing the medicine essentially because the doctors don't want to take risks and the universities don't want to take risks, but the entrepreneurs understand the legal environment they're operating in and that they actually can provide cannabis as medicine. And this is one of the really, the, the big problems in Washington State right now is this whole medical marijuana is a farce, the system needs to go away because every, it's all fake and it's just a bunch of stoners. And there's a quote in your book where you say, what if I had had it, what if I'd, I've had it wrong? What if it's you know, the stoners that keep coming in to buy the weed that are providing the economy so that patients can actually get affordable medicine and yeah. often free medicine. Yeah, that's that's one of the you know one of the questions I, I went into the book with. It's like, look, is this really just sort of a, a, a beard for stoners to get their to get their weed, medical marijuana? And what I came away with was was like you say, I, I it ended up turning it on its head where. Essentially, look, this is an imperfect system right now, but it's, the, it's an imperfect system essentially because the federal government has so screwed up um, our information about this plant and the access to it uh, that really, you know, there are honestly a huge amount of people who are using this as a medicine. You know, there are a number of people who are also, you know, talking their way into a card and getting it, getting it, uh, getting it at a dispensary for recreational purposes. That exists. But really, you know, I went back to a dispensary in Washington, D.C. that had 60 patients, 6-0, and it was complete philanthropy. I mean, they were losing money every day they were open. Um, and, you know, I, I, they're doing better now. Washington, D.C. legalized recently, so their, their um, number of patients are opening up. But uh, I, really, I really think that it, it's imperfect, but right now it's the right way to go. It's, it's what we've got, and it's, it's, a, it's a form of progress. Mm. Yeah, so uh, Christian, I'd like a, your take on being both an entrepreneur and a healthcare provider, I guess. Uh, um, I, I don't think there's been a single dispensary store owner I've, I've spoken with who, whatever their intentions were in terms of getting into the business, were about making money, didn't find themselves actually becoming true believers in serving patients. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could describe your experience with that process. Absolutely. Um, as I said before, I'm, I'm really, like, deeply grateful that I've had the opportunity to do this in a for-profit state, and it's provided for me, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, aside from that, my, um, I've, I've seen this, this plant help people that I least expected. Um, my mom's boyfriend, Bob, that I referred to easy, earlier, he died of liver cancer about 18 months ago. And he... Um, Never used marijuana, never smoked it once, uh, but he found real relief during his chemotherapy by using some edibles. And it was, uh, he, would, he had the unfortunate liver cancer, and so he had the unfortunate um, chemo track of every week until you die. And uh, he didn't have a lot of hope about it and was pretty despondent, uh, felt very ill, and was taking just boatloads of pills. And so he started using this and and it really, the way it evolved was very natural. It was from my mom making a suggestion and then kind of coming to me and saying, you know, could you get this for him? And I did. And it was this really like person to person thing. And I ended up getting Bob a couple of suckers and he tried one and I was really surprised. He came back and he goes, you know what? That really helped. He would go in on Monday afternoon and get chemo. And when he would leave chemo, he would have one sucker. And that would basically do enough to quell his nausea, give him a little bit of euphoria, and let him go to sleep. Then he'd wake up on Tuesday mornings, and he'd have another one. And that would give him a little bit more, you know, quell his nausea, give him some hunger, give him a little bit of euphoria. And he found that on Tuesdays, he could take less opiates. And he found a huge benefit from that, quality of life issue. And so um, he, you know, he really started to see that. And so that, and I could, I could, I could go on for honestly, an hours on all the anecdotal uh, evidence I have of the different people that this plant's benefited. But the, 
you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm very grateful for what we get to do, but also I see a huge benefit in this. And there's not just the direct medical benefit of like the true medical aspects of cannabis, the Phoenix tears that might, you know, fight cancer or the, you know, the, just the use of smoking it that might help the sick to take less painkillers. But it's also that in our society, this is a less dangerous alternative to substances we regularly use. You know, um, of, the, of the substances we use that kill more people than marijuana, you know, sugar is on top of that list, alcohol is even higher, tobacco is even higher. And so the use of marijuana can be really attributed to less um, damage to society, less damage to the individual than a lot of things we have out there right now. So I both believe in, in marijuana as a true medical um, there's true medical purpose to the use of marijuana, but then there's also just a beneficial purpose that you, this is going to be of benefit if you use it compared to other substances. Uh, yeah, uh, are we? Uh, <coughs> thought we were going to get a notice when it's time to open it up. Uh, time to open it up. Wonderful. We have about uh, about ten minutes for questions. So if uh, if you have a question, you can come to one of these mics. Um, and try to be sure to keep your question in the form of a question, and um, just so we can get through as many as we can in, in about 10 minutes. So, thank you. Free joints for the first question. <laughs> the cup winner? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That was a question. You said, is it, is it the cup winner? So you won. Uh, see me afterwards, out back. Yeah. <laughs> Rephrase it, what was the cup winner? What strain? Mm -hmm. What were the two laws that just got passed? Uh, well, the legislature just passed uh, 5250, basically, which was the uh, uh, strangely misnomered Patient Protection Act. Uh, uh, and uh, it wasn't that there were two laws that were passed, there were two new felonies created at the state level that basically are redundant because we already have them as felonies at the federal level, but somehow we needed to create two new felonies for the transfer of medical cannabis, transfer and distribution or production of medical cannabis that is not registered with the 502 system. So we have two new classes of felonies at the state level recriminalizing medical cannabis. It goes into effect July 2016. So you won't hear about it tomorrow uh, in, in your face, but this is what's been happening. It's a stage for farmer to win, don't you? Yeah. Um, you, met, you mentioned the almost schizophrenia, the different realities of what we're coming to know here and the rest of the country, let alone the world. I, I've talked to a number of people from here that now have to be a little careful when they travel out of the state because they see things. But within this state where you know, the majority of the folks voted for it, at the local level of activism, where you're trying to deal with the local governments that are being obstructionists, not giving permits, you know, raising the bar like crazy, quadrupling the cost of putting it in, the, in this county, I'm noticing the same thing. And I, I just want to throw something out with the fear, because the idea of being educating people through experience seems huge. But I have a question for you. I am seeing otherwise intelligent people, in many cases my neighbors, absolutely freaked out about what this is going to do to their property values, what it's going to do to their kids, what it's going to do to the morals of their community, and uh, what it's going to do with respect to Uzis going off in the neighborhood. And we're, we're trying to fight that with fact-based arguments, but it's not working uh, thus far. So your, the question, how do you think we can better educate the populace about the realities of this drug? Through the experience or just through patients' perseverance and being the good professional folks that we all are? You know, I, have, I have one quick, simple answer to that. Uh, marijuana was a $70 billion a year industry in the United States before I got here. It's going to be regardless if I'm here or not. Do you want people like me running that industry, or do you want the Mexican drug cartels? Because I do ID people and pay taxes and follow the rules. They don't. This isn't going away. It's demand-driven. People keep asking for it, and they're going to keep getting it. The question is, whose hands do we want to put the responsibility in? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dive right into that because I live in a place, Bainbridge Island, that voted, I think, more than 70% for 502. I mean, we were near top of the state. Um, 
And when it came time to zone for growing and zone for one retail shop, the entire island um, was all of a sudden up in arms um, over whether we should allow a shop or whether we should allow grows. Um, and ultimately, we really, really restricted it. Um, it was uh, basically restricted it to a little patch of land on the north part of the island. And I think really the idea was that it was so restrictive that most people assumed that it was not going to happen. Well, guess what? <laughs> they found a lease. Um, so there is a shop going in in this one little small quiet section of the, of the island now. Um, but, you know, I, that I think is, is happening across the state where um, even if people voted for it in theory, all of a sudden they get cold feet when it, it's their neighbor who wants to set up a, a, a small grow or it's coming to their neighborhood in the form of a shop. And honestly, I think just simple experience and good business people are going to move the, move the needle on that. Um, essentially, I know in my community, the unspoken thought was, let's, let's let Seattle go ahead. Let's let Tacoma go ahead. We'll see how they do, and once we see that, then we'll maybe revisit, you know? Um, I think the other part of it is, and, and, and you know this firsthand, if you're in this industry, your job is retail politics. You have got to go out and meet the leaders in your community, meet um, not just the elected leaders, but the vocal leaders, the people who are the networkers, Show them who, the, who you are, what your intentions are. You know, if you're from that community, let them know, look, I'm your neighbor. I've been here for 20 years. I live, I live down there on this, on this street. Here's why I want to do this. Here's how I'm doing it. Here's why I think it's going to be a benefit. Because I've seen the other way where people who have the license don't show up. And it's a big mystery. And as soon as it's a big mystery, then at the absolute worst nightmare in everybody's head is who they picture running this business. And they, they literally like picture the Hells Angels coming in every Tuesday and Friday to pick up. So I think time and good business um, and, and openness really, really will help. But it's, it's, it's a difficult situation right now, yeah. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here tonight. Um, Christian, you talked about the marijuana business being in the 70 billion range. I was watching CNBC and Bloomberg News on 420, and they're talking, that they were estimating that maybe uh, five to 10 years out, the legal market may be in the 15 to 20 billion range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it seems like it sells, you know, pots in the newspaper all the time, you know, the, the CNN specials, it, it, uh, it captures the audience, if mm -hmm. nothing else, and the business aspect helps to legitimize it to a degree. Um, I, I think about the 70 billion now that's being routed through banking channels, through uh, money laundering, mm -hmm. that if we actually cl clamp down on where huge <coughs> volumes of money come from, um, the cartels wouldn't have it so easy, yeah. for one. Um, the, the other point separately um, is, uh, in my view, marijuana is a good thing. I'm not. It's not because we can't stop it. It's a good thing. It should be, you know, alcohol is not a good thing for everybody, but in overall, it's it's a good thing, you know. And I think we're still so shamed and such a judgmental society that oh my God, could somebody actually stand up in public and say it's a good thing? And we don't have that at this level. We'll still have oh well, it's good for Charlotte's Web kids, and. Uh, you know, it's better than putting people in jail. But, you know, it creates a euphoria. It creates a, a sense of pleasure. And, my God, you know, are we such Puritans that we can't get past, right. you know, everything's bad? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, it's funny. Um, sh the word shame is interesting because I think shame plays into a lot of the problems that we've had um, with marijuana and, and um, over-imprisonment because there's a big assumption that essentially the people in prison deserve to be there. Um, and I think the shame plays into that quite a bit. Um, I was in, uh, like I say, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and I, I, I did a little lunchtime thing at a, at a, at a local think tank there, and there were um, a couple guys there from, um, uh, basically they were kind of Fox News commentator folks, and they're interested in this issue from a much more of a libertarian perspective, you know, freedom and everything like that. And so I sort of tried the, the, uh, you know, the idea that, that you know, maybe we were throwing a few too many people in jail 
um, over this thing. And his response was really instructive. It was just like, Psh. and it was just like, Psh. like really, like thousands and thousands and thousands of people are in prison over this, and you're just, eh. They're probably, if not for pot, something else. You know, that's, that's the assumption. I think shame plays a big, a big part in that. And that's why I think openness, wherever you stand on marijuana, just having a conversation, thank God for Rick Steves, having a conversation about it in a rational and open way is, is, is an enormous improvement. Mm. You know, yeah, I, I believe marijuana is a good thing too. Um, you know, marijuana is not even marijuana, it's cannabis. It's the real name of the plant. Uh, Henry Angslier did a great job of telling, giving us a new name. But cannabis um, has, a, has a role in our lives. And for tens of thousands of years, we've lived next to this plant. And it's actually to the point that human beings, unique in, among mammals, uh, we have uh, can cannabinoid receptors in our brains. We actually have something called an endocannabinoid system that modulates our, our, uh, our neurological centers. And there's a, a neurobiologist that I'm good friends with in Colorado, a woman named Dr. Michelle Ross, and she has this uh, theory that there's a, an actual uh, cannabinoid deficiency in our diets. And it's because we've lived next to this plant for so long that we've, we've ingested it, and that if we're eating, if we're now all of a sudden it's completely out of our systems, not only is it a good thing, but we've actually made it a necessary thing as part of our bodies. And she called, talks about a deficiency of what she refers to as vitamin weed. If you, <laughs> if you Google vitamin weed, she, she's a full advocate for this, and she basically says, hey, we don't need to smoke it, we need to eat it in its raw form. You know, THC only is psychoactive after it's heated up, and so the, she's really saying, hey, go ahead and eat it. Eat it, you know, put it, she wants to do um, cold pressed juices or eat it, put it on your salad because the THCA, the inactive form of THC or the CBDA, we, will actually help to strengthen and rebuild your endocannabinoid system, which could, in her very scientific and doctoral perspective, reduce um, issues around uh, immune deficiency disorders and certain um, disorders around inflammation. And so there's actually a lot of, you know, again, there, the con conceptual uh, conception out there that marijuana is like, it's really good. It's necessary. We've lived next to it forever. I don't know if you know this, but the, the first time a human being ever got high was when lightning struck a marijuana plant upstream, uh, upwind from, a, from the cavemen. And the plant caught on fire and it blew all the wind in and they all sat there and breathed I've got it. the date on that. It's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And he, and he probably knows this too, but little known fact, 30 minutes later was the first official pizza delivery. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I want to add something really quick, which is that um, there is such a thing as the endocannabinoid system, but only like 5% of medical schools in, in the United States actually train their doctors in knowledge about the endocannabinoid system. Our experts don't know enough to be able to regulate this stuff and the, yeah. like the information quest is ongoing and infinite really every every corner of our society needs to be educated on this well i think it's when listen as an entrepreneur i look at this and i think this is one of the hugely exciting parts of this this what's happening is that marijuana is both it's a it's a recreational substance that people are have embraced for a long time and continue to embrace there's there's uh, qualities that we can use it for for pulp and hemp uh, and and uh, fabrics but then there's also this huge medical thing that has to be really reviewed. And you know, the, the Industrial Revolution basically took place while marijuana was out back and not allowed in. And so now all this technology has been created around the rest of the world, but marijuana has been left out. So what's going to happen when we bring marijuana back into medical research and we bring it back into the creation of new fibers and we bring it back into nutrition and dietary needs? I mean, it's, I think we're going to learn a lot of really unique and interesting things. And it's not always going to hold true to what we hope for or expect. But as again, as an entrepreneur, you look at this and you're like, well, there's like unlimited potential with what this could be. And uh, again, for those people that are interested in going out and like tackling one particular aspect of this, it's like there's, there's a wide open go for it right now. Uh, you know, for hemp, for example, great product. We have no way of processing hemp in the United States. All the, all the machines that we use to process, you know, wood and wool and all that don't work on hemp. It, the, 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 fi the fibers are just different. And so here's if anyone is an entrepreneur out there go put the machinery together to, 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 so that we can turn hemp into useful products. 
because it, they don't exist in the U.S. right now. I do know a guy in Colorado that actually has made that machine. No, oh. <laughs> never mind. Question. Question. Um, we, there's kind of been this undercurrent that we're moving toward the light of acceptance and progress forward. How do we avoid backsliding? And do you have any concern that with change of administration, we could take a step backward? And, and again, how do we avoid get going in the wrong direction? You know, a year ago, I thought it was, a real, it was really a, a toss-up. Um, I thought we had three years of the Obama administration to try this out. You know, a year later, I don't think it's that simple. I think it, we're moving far enough and fast enough that whoever the next president is, it could be really difficult to, to, to say, no, this is over, we're, we're clamping down, uh, especially because I think most people expect California to pass legalization in 2016, unless factions <laughs> go against each other. <laughs> you don't, oh, let's open that up. Um, but I, 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 the, the main thing, I think, is uh, for Washington and Colorado to succeed, um, kids are the flashpoint. I think, um, and kids, the combination of kids and edibles, I think, right now, are the flashpoint, and that could go, could go wrong. Um, but I'm much more hopeful than I was a year ago. Yeah, I, um, I, th I think the, you know, to avoid backsliding, it's a, uh, kind of like you were saying, it, it's, it's at that retail level, at that, this point of inflection, um, the people that are activists, and they say we have to be, we have to be good communicators. And what that means really also is listening and understanding when, we, the, when there's this potential to backslide, like what's the resistance from those, the other side? Why, what is it about marijuana that, that they're afraid of? And, and, and really, and I, I say this as an entrepreneur who makes my living doing this, and then you have to sit there and look that person in the eye and be present to where they're coming from and hear them and deal with them from where they're coming from and not pontificate about what I think the world should be like or is like. And so I spend a lot of time doing that, you know, and there's a lot of people that have very real resistance to this for very good reasons. And I think it's real important not to dismiss those, those claims, but to really listen to them, try to be open, and especially if I'm hearing something that I haven't heard before, and, um, and acknowledge that. And I, I think that what I've found is that, um, you know, that the, the, the what is it? What did Gandhi say? That you know, love, the truth, and love always prevail, always. And I really believe that this is true. And I, I, and as long as I'm you know continuing to do my work with love, I think that we will prevail. But it's really important that as the, that to, that not step back is that we as an as a movement don't get self righteous about the fact that I'm fighting for the good guys, because if I'm fighting, I'm fighting, right? Even if I think I'm a good guy, like. I can't fight. It has to be collaborative. We have to win people over with, with reason and with love and with facts, not just, you know, I'm more right than you are. So. Yeah, I actually want to, want to build on that real quick with, and, and say that I think that the peaceful, you know, mode of communication is, is incredibly important. I think that it's easy to get angry and frustrated, uh, especially at people who just don't know any better. Uh, it's harder to sit and listen and have a dialogue. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, cannabis culture brings is this history of being a peace movement, right? Well, one of the things that's backfired, I think, in Washington State, which is not to, like, you know, let the legislators off the hook and so forth, is that we've become divided and we fight, we've fought amongst ourselves in, in terms of a, a peace movement. Uh, and it, uh, our face has not always been a peaceful face down there in Olympia. And I think that it has worked to our disadvantage. Uh, and uh, honestly, I think, um, I think trying to focus, build a con building common ground is the way to keep going forward, is, is focusing on your common ground. Take every little slice of common ground that you can get and hammer on that. Uh, rather than uh, amplifying uh, your differences. Because I do think that when people find common ground on one thing, it makes it easier to actually like, create more common ground. So, uh, you know, the peaceful method, I would say. Building on that uh, cultural history, I think, of, uh, of focusing on peace instead of war. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming you. out.
Thank you.